Hey there folks, Rob here. Welcome back to the show. So it's been a while since we did one of these, but I thought today would be a good time to do another episode of Ask Polymer. So I, I went on Twitter, I asked uh, uh, folks if they had any questions for me, and here are some of the top questions that were sent in by uh, you, the actual viewers. So the first question is from Micho, who asks, how do I make the app drawer panel automatically close when I click a link in my, uh, my application? So that's a really good question. I think we actually maybe used to do this for you using the old Polymer Starter Kit. We're not doing it now in the new Polymer Starter Kit. But basically, what you can do is you can actually wire up a binding to the opened property or the opened attribute of the uh, the drawer panel, and uh, then you can just you know toggle that value every time the router changes the page. So that might not make sense when I'm just saying it like this. And what I'll do instead is I'll I'll drop a link down in the uh, description that has an example, so you can just follow that. And also, I think we might just add this behavior to the Polymer Starter Kit, uh, the one that we just rolled out. Maybe expect like a, a point release soon when we just like add this in so you don't have to wire it up yourself. So thank you for that question, Micho. All right, this question comes from uh, Eric Beidelman, who asks, I hear Polymer 2's out. What's up with that? So yeah, maybe some of you have seen on Twitter uh, and, and on the Polymer blog, we were recently tweeting that we have a preview branch of Polymer 2.0 available right now. You can find that over on the GitHubs, and I will uh, include a link to that as well down in the show notes. So Polymer 2, kind of the, the main idea there is we want to get folks onto the new v1 versions of the web component standards. So custom elements v1 and shadow DOM v1. The, uh, the current version of Polymer 1.x is based on the old v0 implementations. Uh, those shipped in Chrome and, and Opera and some other browsers experimented with those versions of the, the standards. But they are never going to be sort of the, the native one that ships everywhere. Instead, after sort of reworking things a bit, the browsers decided to make some changes. And those changes are in the v1 specs. So that's what's going to be shipping in all the different browsers. I believe Safari recently just shipped Shadow DOM v1. It'll be coming in Chrome really soon. And because there are some breaking changes, we needed to migrate Polymer as well. And the important thing to note here is that those breaking changes uh, for, the, for the web component specs, those are probably like set in stone now. So we don't have to worry about you know, suddenly a, a v2 appearing out of nowhere uh, for, for the web component specs or anything like that. Uh, the nice thing is that going forward, web components should be backwards compatible. So yes, there are some breaking changes right now, but you know, hopefully minimal pain. Um, I just kind of I wrote down a few things from Polymer 2 that I'm really excited about that I, I wanted to tell you all about stuff that I just think is super cool. Uh, aside from moving over to the new standards, uh, we're going to be providing kind of like a backwards compatibility layer. So if you're you know you've got a bunch of Polymer 1 elements and you you want to try and start to migrate those to Polymer 2, uh, we have the old Polymer constructor available to you. So you know you can seriously just do like a few small changes and and voila you've got Polymer 2 elements. Uh, but the other thing that we're doing now is we're, we're baking in support for ES6 classes. So that's something that a lot of people really wanted. Uh, now, the sort of the, the default and the, the standard encouraged way to build a Polymer 2 element is going to be to actually inherit from a class. And then you've got all sort of the, the niceties of, of working with ES6 there. Um, we're getting rid of things like Polymer.dom, which was always really confusing for folks, the whole shady DOM thing. Uh, instead, we're going to be uh, shipping a new, improved Shadow DOM polyfill. We're going to stop talking about local DOM and all the all these you know shady DOM, these random terms that never made sense. Uh, instead, we're just going to say, hey, it's Shadow DOM. We've got a new polyfill. It's nice and fast. Uh, and we're making the data binding system a lot easier to reason about too. So if you ever had issues where you would change like an object inside of an array or change like an object sub property and things just like wouldn't update, uh, we should be fixing those in Polymer 2 to make that just like a lot more straightforward. So that is kind of a high level overview. Um, again, I'll, I'll include a link for the uh, the 2.0 preview branch down in the show notes so you can go check it out yourself, read through the README, and uh, and and give it a test run. I'm I'm really interested to hear what all of you think. So please leave some comments down below uh, with your thoughts on that. So uh, thank you, Eric, for that for that question. All right, uh, next question. Sam Sacconi asks, I hear you are a corgi. What is up with that? So yeah, that's true. My uh, my spirit animal actually is, is the corgi. Thank you for that question, Sam. All right, our next question comes from Jerry, who asks, how do I implement ES6 syntax with Polymer CLI? So today, what you can do is you can use the uh, the custom build generator that we showed off. I think 
maybe two episodes ago. I'll include a link down in the show notes to that particular episode. Uh, and what that does is it actually kind of gives you a little escape hatch out of the Polymer CLI build. It lets you actually uh, use the same node module that powers the, the Polymer build, but it lets you also kind of hook into its lifecycle and add your own gulp tasks. One of those gulp tasks could be you know, something like Babel. So uh, you, could, you could write all your elements using HTML imports. Uh, the Polymer build will actually split out the JavaScript into its own stream. You then pass that through Babel, uh, and then it recombines it all at the end for you. So that's the option that you could use today. However, as, as I mentioned before, we're going to be rolling out full-blown ES6 support in Polymer 2. So you know, if you're able to wait to Polymer 2 time, uh, we might have a better story for you there. It might be a little bit easier to use. So if I was doing this today, I would actually probably stick with just like you know, uh, the the current Polymer one syntax, and then kind of wholesale move over to ES6 when Polymer two rolls out. Uh, hope that answers your question. Thank you, Jerry. All right, the next question is from Steven, who says, "I'm still confused about how to uh, load in third-party JavaScript in my elements." So that's a good question. Um, you know, what a lot of people do, I've seen kind of two approaches. One approach would be you just say, hey, I depend on this library, and you've got to include the script tag for that library before you import your elements. Uh, what I actually prefer to do is to take the script tag for whatever dependency I'm depending on, put that into its own HTML import, and then have my elements import that file. The nice thing there is your elements are now explicit about their dependency because you know it's that that link tag is up at the top of their definition file, and also HTML imports will deduplicate um, multiple requests to the same resource. So if you've got you know five elements that are all trying to import the same thing, it's actually going to only be loaded one time. So that's the approach that that I really recommend using. That's the one that we've used in some of our elements, like the the marked element. Um, so yeah, hopefully uh, that approach works for you. And also, I think in the future we're probably going to also be exploring things like uh, you know maybe how we can use like ES module loaders or something like that. That's definitely in the Polymer two realm of possibilities. Uh, so we might have a, a, an improved story there as well soon. So uh, yeah, thank you, Stephen, for that question. All right, next question comes from Thomas, who asks: Once all web component features are broadly and correctly supported in all major browsers, is Polymer's job done? So. Yes and no a little bit. Definitely the job of polyfilling web components is done at that point, which is great. We, we want to get rid of polyfills. We want to get rid of any sort of inconsistencies that they introduce, and just be doing everything native. But web component standards are inherently low level, and, and that's by design, right? They're, they're supposed to give developers maximum flexibility. However, that also means that it can require a fair bit of code to create your own elements, stamp out your Shadow DOM, put your templates inside of them, and stuff like that. So Polymer will probably always be around in some fashion to offer this sort of like helper support, right? Sometimes we refer to it as like sugaring the native web component standards, just making you essentially much more efficient. So that is kind of always been the, the direction for the library. We wanted those polyfills to sort of evaporate away. And then you're just left with this really nice, clean helper library that just makes you, you know, more efficient as you're building components. So uh, thank you, Thomas, for that question. All right, our next question comes from a user on Twitter named GBX who says, how should web components be written to let applications override their default locales? So I am not personally an, an expert on localization or inter internationalization. I can't even say it. Um, uh, L10N, I18N. There we go. That's the easier way to go about it. Uh, my teammate Monica Dinkolescu has actually written some behaviors to help with these. So the one that you would be interested in is called the app localized behavior. And basically, you define a JSON file full of different localized strings based on uh, the, the locale, or they're keyed off of the locale. And then uh, based on the user's locale, it then, uh, in, your, in your element, it uses a little computed binding to match up whatever text you're using to that JSON file and use the right localized version. So our internationalization library works in a very similar fashion. Uh, the one thing to note is that these depend on the internationalization API. And so if you're in a browser that does not support that API, you're also going to need to include a little polyfill. Uh, but that is linked to from the repo for, uh, for app localized and the I18N, I18n behaviors. I'll include a link to these down in the show notes so you don't have to listen to me try and say these words anymore. Uh, but yeah, give those a shot and see if that helps in your app. So thank you for that question, GBX. All right, next question is from Vladislav, who says, what's up with 2.0, Polymer 2.0, I'm assuming, and TypeScript? 
So there's no plans right now to like migrate over to TypeScript or anything like that. However, we do have a lot of members of the Polymer team who really, really like TypeScript, and we definitely want to make sure that we are supporting it better. So I think if you're trying to do this today, you can maybe use something like the, uh, the generator custom build that I, I mentioned before, which we're going to link to down in the show notes, to add the TypeScript compile step to your like gulp build process or something like that. For 2.0, I'm, I'm not quite sure what the exact game plan is going to be, except for I'm, I'm almost certain that we're going to have some better TypeScript story, some sort of improved story around it, because we have so many team members who like it. We have so many Googlers who like using TypeScript. Um, I definitely want to explore it more myself. So I definitely think we'll probably have some more uh, to talk about there. It's little early days right now for Polymer 2.0 to know exactly what that strategy is going to be. Um, but if you're interested in TypeScript and you're interested in Polymer, stay tuned, because I, I, I'm sure we're going to have something uh, more exciting for you in the future on that topic. So thank you, uh, Vladislav, for sending that in. All right, the last question comes from Ido, who says, how do I share information when I am transitioning between two pages? And what are the best practices for communicating between elements? So I'm actually going to answer this sort of in reverse order, because I think the, the second answer helps answer the first question. When you're communicating between elements, you actually probably don't want to have like siblings talking to each other or anything like that. We, we generally try to discourage that, uh, mainly because it, it means that element A has to be sort of coupled and sort of know about element B over here. And we, we kind of don't want that, that, that level of coupling. Instead, what we recommend is to figure out a common parent between both of your elements and have your elements be kind of like as simple and as dumb as they can be and just sort of dispatch events out to that common parent. Like, hey, something you know I was clicked on or something like that. And then the common parent can act as sort of the, the orchestrator saying, oh, I I hear that this child over here was clicked on, and I know that that means that some action needs to happen with child B over here. What this does is it keeps element A and element B very simple and reusable, and all your business logic then kind of gets moved up into that like higher order element. And we usually refer to this as like a mediator component. And I'll include a link down in the bottom to my teammate Kevin Schaff's talk from, uh, I think this was from like Polymer Summit maybe two years ago or a year ago. Uh, where he talked about this pattern and how we, we tend to use it in most of our apps. So that's how we recommend doing communication around the page. And so then the, the first question was, how do I share information when I'm going from page one to page two? Well, in that case, I think you know if you have information that needs to belong to multiple pages, that to me is stuff that belongs in one of those higher order components, like something that, that you know kind of lords over all of the pages even. And it's just binding it down into the child pages. And you, know, you can have that higher level component listen for changes coming out of some of these, these lower level components and, and changing its state and then pushing that down. Uh, but that way, again, you're, sort of, you're, you're simplifying things so that the business logic that you know, where you've got two related things, the business logic for that is going to live higher up, and they don't have to try and talk to each other and figure out how each other works. So yeah, I hope that answers the question. I know it's sort of like a, a broad, abstract answer, but that's generally the pattern that we recommend. And, um, and definitely go check out Kevin's talk, which covers it in a lot more detail. So thank you, Ido, for that great question. That about covers it for today. If you yourself have some questions for me, you can leave them down below in the comments, or you can ping me on a social network of your choosing at hashtag AskPolymer. As always, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. All right, you ready? Localization, inter internationalization. I just slam it all together. So like internationalization. It's close enough. That's why. That's why you just shorten it. You write I18N.